With the vast majority of vehicles that we feature in this series, you could genuinely say that as well as being interesting from a technical point of view, quite a few of them are also pretty cool to look at, even something like the Bellorens Long Nose Land Rover. It might not be to everyone's taste, but it's an interesting looking car at the very least, and some people, I would say myself included, could even say that they like the look of the car. I certainly think it's a striking looking vehicle, a number of others as well might not be conventionally pretty, but they're at least eye-catching and interesting. Some of them for a purpose, some of them just to be different. This one, on the other hand, well, I've got to say I'm not a fan of this car's design. Now, I'm sure there are some people who love the look of this car. Many people haven't even heard of it, of course, but those who have tend to give it a fair amount of respect because of what it's capable of. Now, the vehicle in question is one which, as I said, most of you guys, or at least many, if not most, probably aren't familiar with. And this vehicle, or in fact a couple of different vehicles, are produced by a company called Orca Engineering, who are based in Liechtenstein, and were actually founded by a father and son by the name of Beck, René and Ralph Beck. Way back in 2003 they set up the company, and they had a planned run of a couple of different cars, in a similar way to how Koenigsegg has the same essential design underneath most of their cars, and how the Zonda is basically multiple variants of that essential core design, that's what they wanted to do as well. They called it the 113 series. Now, the car that's best known from Orca, for those who do know of it at least, is the C113. Now, this car is the base model, if you will. There are three different variations. There's the C113, the R113, and the primary car in this episode, because it's the ultimate one, the SC7. Now, the car was planned to have a considerable production run, around 200 cars, which would have meant that there would be as many of these on the road as there are Moslers, at least before they went bankrupt. In the end, though, they built seven, so <laughs> quite a considerable difference, but given the look of the car, you can kind of understand why. It certainly divides opinion, it's extremely angular, almost to the point where you could think it might even still be a... a a car that was made out of the imagination of a kid who drew a car, or built out of cardboard kind of thing, or again, a kit car, you could say. This kind of idea of a build-it-yourself on a budget supercar, which in itself is a cool thing. It's an amazing idea to have an affordable approach so that somebody else, apart from a manufacturer, can build their own supercar. And there are some great examples of that. The GTM supercar, for instance, you can buy the rolling chassis, put your own body on top of it, various other options as well. Companies like Super Performance, for instance, do options like that also. This one kind of looks like that, but it's not a build-it-yourself supercar, it's from a factory. Now, the factory only has 15 employees, or at least they did, because technically they don't exist anymore, and later on the company actually became what's probably a slightly better known, but still very obscure car, by the name of the Beck LM800, of course directly having its founder's name this time. Now, I'm not a fan of that car, I think it looks even worse than this one in terms of quality, but one thing that they have in common is that in a similar way to how Lee Noble developed a number of great supercars like the Ascaria Cosse, the Noble M12 and various others, they have a great core concept, because regardless of the look of the car, what is not arguable is that these are fast seriously fast supercars. In fact, although many of you guys probably haven't heard of it, it's actually one of the quickest supercars in the world. Now, for top speed, it's not fully proven, so we can't say for sure, but for acceleration, it has been tested on a couple of occasions, and it is indeed one of the fastest supercars around. Now, the original, the C113, of which they actually produced three of them, so it's pretty rare, far rarer than most supercars around, is powered by an Audi engine, a 4.2 litre V8, it's turbocharged, putting out around 650 horsepower or so, which is pretty decent, but it's also very light. It's quoted to weigh under a tonne, or in other words, less than a thousand kilos. That's impressive. Now the performance would pretty obviously be fast in a car like that, but it really is. 0 to 60 is under 3 seconds. Now, the top speed is quoted to be different depending on who you ask, but it's definitely in excess of 200 miles per hour, some say closer to around 220. Now, given the power, that is believable, and for the acceleration, as I said, it has been tested, and it's not surprising that it's quick for that, given the low weight and huge power, but as far as a track car, 
it's not really known what kind of ability it has. It has a level of downforce, but not necessarily a huge amount, and it looks more like the kind of supercar that's for posing on the street rather than setting a good lap time, although based on the race car-esque shape, it could have some lap time potential, but again, not much is known about it in that regard. Now, the rarest model that they've actually produced, and they did apparently build two of these, is a Roadster version, an open top called the R113. Now, this car is so rare that I've never seen one, even on Google. Now, if something is so rare that you can't even find it on Google, you know it's pretty rare. And that seems strange, because if there are two of them around, why have there never been any photos taken of it? Now, granted, it's not the prettiest thing around, but usually even ugly cars get photographed at some point, and yet these manage to, at least from what I've seen, evade capture by the camera lens. Now, the final car, the one in particular for this video, is the SC7. Now, two of these were produced, and the SC7 was designed to be the ultimate version. It looks basically the same, but it's finished in black, whereas the C113 is the car in the video that you can see in orange, and the SC7 has a different engine. A 12-cylinder Audi engine putting out a quoted 850 horsepower in a car that's incidentally quoted to weigh about 800 to 850 kilos. Now, the performance is, it goes without saying, incredibly quick. The base car already did 60 miles per hour, or 0 to 60 miles per hour, in less than three seconds. This one's quoted about 2.6 to 2.7, which is entirely believable. Top end speed is quoted to be around 400 kilometers per hour, which in other words is basically 250 miles per hour. That's believable from a certain point of view, but again, unproven, so it's yet to be seen, and probably never will be proven, given how rare and obscure the car is, and how most people probably wouldn't care to take it to that kind of speed. But later on, even the Beck LM800, which shared again the V8 option from the older Orca 113 series, is also quoted to be capable of around 250. Now that car looks like it might actually be able to do that, because it's much closer to, for instance, a long-tail Group C car in terms of its appearance. But again, as I said earlier, I'm not a fan of that car. It just doesn't look quite right, it looks a bit cheap and plasticky. But hey, if it gets the job done, the original Mosler, for instance, the Consulia, it's not exactly a pretty machine, but it was dominant, that's for sure. So ultimately, this is one of those supercars which, in a similar way to a couple of the others that we've discussed, isn't necessarily going to break records across the board, although on this occasion it is one of the fastest accelerating supercars. It's one which is just interesting to have on your radar. Is it an unsung hero in a general sense? Well, not particularly, but it's an unsung hero, certainly in with a group of cars that are better known, although they're actually very similar. Stuff like the Mosler or the Gumper Apollo, which is a direct rival for this car. So ultimately, it's not one of my personal favourites, but it's certainly a car that's worth noting, at the very least, even if you're not a fan of it. It is respectable that they made a car with such a small team that actually turned out to be real fast questionably designed. So, if you want to check out plenty of other interesting, oddball, weird, wacky, wonderful cars in this series, you can click through at the end and see those, but for now, as always, thanks for watching.